the word why. What a curious word. The kind of word that can make us cringe, feel defensive, or even distant. But you know, sometimes why is the key. The key that can unlock so much to our lives. Join me as we explore the why with fascinating contributors to the world. Those that entertain us, inform us, teach us about life, and if we're lucky, inspire the next in all of us. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger, and welcome to Headroom, a production of Rainlight and co-produced by Old Soul. Let's go. Welcome to another episode of Headroom. I'm Dr. Rod Berger. What a treat we have for you today. I spent time with Ellen V. Siegel. Dr. Siegel is chairperson and founder of Friends of Cancer Research, or better known as Friends. She's also the chair of the board of directors of the Reagan Udall Foundation, a partnership designed to modernize medical product development, accelerate innovation, and enhance product safety in collaboration with the FDA. She serves on the board of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, where she chairs its Public-Private Partnerships Committee. In 2010, she was appointed to the inaugural Board of Governors of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute as a representative of patients and health consumers, and was recently appointed to another six-year term. Additionally, in 2016, she was named to Vice President Biden's Cancer Moonshot Blue Ribbon Panel to the Parker Institute for Immunotherapy Advisory Group and joined the inaugural Board of Advisors for the George Washington University's Milken Institute of Public Health. She also holds leadership positions with a broad range of cancer advocacy, public policy organizations, and academic health centers. She is a treat. She is a trailblazer, and I truly hope that this conversation does her legacy justice. What an incredible woman. Enjoy, Ellen Siegel. Okay, Ellen, I, I'm saying this off air. There are so many directions to go with your background. Um, and I here's, here's my read on things, is that sometimes there are human beings that just when we wind them up from the word go, they just kind of keep going and pursuing, and they don't have an endpoint. And and I say that with great affection for your background uh, professionally and the things that you've accomplished. That you, there's there's no stopping point for you. It's that you know if you can make a difference, you continue to make a difference. And and that has driven a lot of what you have done to not only be a trailblazer as a woman, uh, but someone who continues to push the envelope for the betterment of our healthcare system. So with that as the backdrop, when you when you think back to your professional career and when things started, because it was in a very different industry. Can you talk a little bit about how you, how you thought about and conceptualized personal goals? I never did. It just, you know, I was recently interviewed for an article in Nature about 25 years of friends and breakthrough. And I characterized myself as an accidental tourist. And probably that's correct. I didn't have goals. I cared deeply about education. I cared about interest, but I never sat down at 17 or 18 or 20, and frankly, not even now, and 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 had wrapped out a, a, a road plan that just a roadmap that wasn't the way it is for me. It is a matter of interest, passion, and the ability to do something and make a difference. So it, you know, I didn't plan on my sister dying at 40 and changing my life. You know, uh, I didn't, you know, at 15, I met the man I love and who ever thought that that would impact my life and making a decision to 15 would be so important in my life. I mean, it just didn't have a grand plan. So, so let's, let's then rewind even further back, even before 15, take me back to your childhood and, and sort of family uh, ecosystem. Was that, were you a product in that regard um, of the family around you in that, to your point about you just, you, you were an accidental tourist, right? So goals really weren't there. It's just, you maybe knew one way and that one way is, is incredibly efficient and um, beneficial to those, not just directly tied to you, but to, to a lot of people. Um, was that sort of the, the tone of the, of the household? Yeah, the tone of the household was believe in yourself. There were never specific goals. You have to do well in school. You can't, you know, you have to go to college to be a teacher. It wasn't anything like that. Oh, my sister at four was interested in fashion design. I mean, she was completely, she would do cutout dolls and she knew what she wanted at four. I had no idea at all about what I wanted, but we did come from a home. My mother worked, my parents had a business. We were middle-class, but very believe in your children. And it's not, we, my parents were 
anything but helicopter parents. They were like, okay, if that's what you really want to do, um, seems a little odd, but go do it. I mean, I was accepted to Harvard and I decided to go to Brooklyn College. And, you know, well, that's a little strange, but, you know, okay, if that's what you want to do. So there was never the 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 plan well this is the way you should be doing it you should wait till you're 25 to get married and you know and wait till you have your career we i it established i mean i was in college and we were married at 20 before i was finished college and nobody said you couldn't do it and probably no one could have told me i couldn't do it so so take me to that that what an inflection point in your life to be accepted at harvard and to basically take a left turn um and go to go to a to Brooklyn College and not to the sort of flagship or at least what people have in their their minds when they think about the elite of education, not just in the U.S. but across the world. Tell me about your personality back then. I mean, did you realize that you you had sort of a different perspective than other young women your age? Was it because this feels very unique to me? This does not feel like. You know, I just picture, you know, you walking around and there are, you know, hundreds of Ellen making the same kind of of decision. Did you did you find yourself as being an outsider, an insider or just someone who had a different perspective? Well, my parents were wonderful and perhaps a little unsophisticated. I don't know if my children made that decision that I'd say that's a good deal. <laughs> I probably would say, well, <laughs> you got to think about that. But uh, the decision was based solely on the fact that, well, first of all, in those days, Brooklyn College was an excellent school. So it was a very fine school. And although my parents were not poor, I didn't see any reason they should be paying for an education when I can go for free. But the primary decision was I wanted to be with Jerry. And Jerry was, you know, we were, you know, I was 17, 18, and I knew if I went away, that relationship may not long-term work out. There was something in me that knew that this man, this young boy that I was in love with was the right one for me. And I didn't want to leave him. And I don't think I understood exactly what I was giving up. I mean, I was a good student um, and my parents could afford to pay, but I didn't feel like this was, are you crazy? It was just, well, I want to be with Jerry. I don't want to be in Boston and he's here and I can go for free. And why should my parents pay this amount of money when I could to have a, you know, a good education at Brooklyn College. I didn't understand, I think, at that time what I was doing. It was just a, a practical decision. I mean, it would be a very different context today. And I don't know, as I said, with my kids or someone else, I would advise them <laughs> to do the same thing. But it worked out for me. It was the right decision for me. When you think about your your career, your professional history, is there a label? Is there a title that you most align with or you associate with? I mean, what what feels the most comfortable? Is it is it entrepreneur? Is it visionary? Is it you know healthcare advocate? Where do, where do you land when you think about how people might describe your efforts professionally? Well, I think I go with my passion. You know, when why did I do a PhD in Russian history? I mean, it wasn't exactly a practical thing to do, but I was really interested I, in literature and history and the Rus Russian Revolution, and it. My interest took me there. There wasn't ever, well, okay, if you do this, where will you work? Will you get a job? You know, are you committed to an academic career? It was just a matter of, well, this is interesting and I want to learn more about it. And the same thing with um, development. When I was a real estate developer, it was that Jerry started his own business. And at that point, I was in between what I really wanted to do, thinking about, because we had traveled so much that I was thinking, well, okay, I, I wasn't committed to an academic career at that point. And he started his business. And I said, well, okay, I'll help him. And then it in 15 minutes, we decided that isn't going to work for either of us. And there was <laughs> development, uh, this opportunity for development. And it was a matter of knowing what I didn't know, but yet belief that I could do something. I, you know, so when the ability to become a real estate developer happened, I knew enough of what that what I didn't know. I did take classes at um, at both Harvard and and Wharton, and I did do these quick, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, three four day classes. But nobody ever said I couldn't do anything. That seems to be a theme that's emerging that through your life, unless someone told you you couldn't or gave you some 
I don't know, detailed plan of why you should make a different decision, you were perfectly okay and comfortable in your own skin to carve your own path. Is that fair? I mean, that's very fair. But, and I don't think there's anybody that could tell me not to do anything. I have, I mean, you know, unless it was something really crazy or dangerous or jumping out. I mean, I, that just, I mean, yes, I very much care about what other people think and I'm interested in seeking advice. But if I have a passion or vision, I'm going to execute on that. But I am going to take input and I'm going to be pragmatic about it. I'm not going to be visionary where I just have a vision and don't do anything. Execution is really important to me. So when we think about young children, so we typically will will cast them as being, you know, fearless, right? So the youngest child will be ready to jump up and and do whatever they're sort of asked. And we as adults might think, oh my goodness, <laughs> fear of heights, like, you know, the fear of the unknown. And as we get older, we start to, we get to sense that from the environment that maybe we should be more cautious. I don't get that sense from you. It's not that, that you were reckless at all. It's just I don't know if it's a quiet confidence in that you could figure it out as you go um, and or that you just had a much more secure relationship with fear than maybe the average bear in that, you know, most people, I think they, they sense maybe what they might not be able to achieve or do, and that prevents them from even trying. Yeah, I, I, you know, it was a very different time. I mean, obviously, the, the the things that kids do today are very different. I mean, you know, I could do anything. I mean, but I didn't do crazy things. I mean, I wasn't jumping off buildings. I was not jumping off, you know, doing insane things. But if I was completely committed to school, that was great. If I didn't have a teacher that I liked, well, they were not, my parents weren't worried. I wasn't reckless. The only thing is that, you know, getting married at 20, When you're not uh, finished with college and you're marrying someone, we were middle class, comfortable, but certainly not rich and married a man who was very poor, came from a, you know, extreme modest is an understatement. And at one point, my parents said, you understand, you know, (laughs) you're not taking vows of poverty, but you understand this could be hard. And I said to them, they, they were not against it at all. And I said, well, for I could live on love. And they looked at me and they said, okay. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and, and they did help us. I mean, they did help us. I mean, they did when I was in college and went to graduate school, they did help us. But but it wasn't as if, are you crazy? You, you gave up Harvard, you're getting married before you're finished college and you're marrying someone who has absolutely no money. And they had no idea about any career aspirations, but we were a good fit and they believed in that and they liked Jerry. It says a lot about your, I think, your family of origin and sort of the environment that they had created. It had to have been created early on because there was an absolute confidence in the relationship you had to then feel the power to make decisions, even at a young age, that were uh, consequential, um, but educated guesses, right, that allowed you to be an experience, not just being a woman, but a human. Well, that's correct. And there were no barriers for women in my childhood at all. My father believed strongly, strongly that women have to be independent and they have to be successful in their own right and have their own identity. And I was raised with that. I mean, my mother did work, but my father always felt strongly that women have an opportunity and should have a career. And I became obsessed with that when I had grandchildren, my granddaughter, Juliana, now who's 21. And I I don't know, I think at five, I was talking to her about Virginia Woolf in a room of one's own uh, <laughs> economic independence and the idea. And I took her to exhibitions and I drilled into her at a very early age. You must be independent. You cannot be dependent. You have to do what you want to do, but you have to be independent in, in your own life. And it was really interesting. I remember t- and remember her rolling her eyes at once to Curtis Shakespeare exhibition on women and and just insisted on her understanding the role of women. Um, but I, my parents didn't have to do that with me. They just believed in us. And I had younger sister, the same thing. I mean, she wanted to be a fashion designer and that was fine. There was never like, oh, well, how are you going to do that? How are you going to afford yourself? This is a hard career. Are you? Do you want to think about it? Not any of the things that we do today to our kids. Take me, take me to the sort of paint the picture for what it was like around you when you built and developed the first residential building on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, Was that an accomplishment as a woman? Was that an accomplishment just in sort of the development world and real estate? Help me understand the context of the time 
um, and the role that you played in that achievement? There were really no women in commercial real estate in those days. There just were not any women. There were women in leasing, maybe not even architecture, certainly not in development or finance. And um, it was really interesting because I cared deeply about the history, the context, what was important to the city. And when I was going to build the first residential on Pennsylvania Avenue, it wasn't a matter of just a box or a building, it had to really meet the environment. It had to meet the needs. At that point, I was chair of the housing commission for the DC for the mayor. And we didn't have downtown housing in DC. There were, you know, nobody lived in DC. So that was very monumental in terms of, I had to go to the zoning commission five times and at one point and change the zoning or the mix of the building. And at one point I said, I promise you, if you give me this, I'll never come back again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but but yes, so it was very unusual. And then, of course, there was tokenism in those days. So then I was asked to go on the board of the real estate advisory trust. There was some sort of big shot organization and no woman. And then all of a sudden I was asked to go on it. So I knew I was different. Um, and, you know, it, there were times I had a partner in those days and we'd go into meetings and we'd always say, we'd always look at one another and say, well, this is yours or this is yours. You know, sometimes the men or the bankers would not even look at me. They would only talk to him. And other times they were fascinated and ignored him. So it was really dependent. It was really funny. And we'd laugh about it. I, You know, uh, my partner, we were mutually beneficial to one another. We we had different, um, you know, skills and we were synergistic. And it wasn't like, Ellen, be careful of these guys. It was, OK, Shelton, these guys are not going to want to talk to me. So you're going to take the lead or other times we'd see the chemistry and say, okay, you know, Ellen, this is yours. You you'll go. And, and I dealt with the citizens groups and I dealt with the, the zoning and dealt with the architects and dealt with a lot of other issues. And he was dealing with finance and other issues. So we had complementary skills. Did you feel a, res a responsibility uh, as a woman that you were representing, not just the work that you were putting forth, but, but your gender? Yes, I did. You know, it, I was strange in that world, and it was very clear that it was an issue. I was on the board of trade. I was on the board of directors of the board of trade, the only woman at that time in a very male-dominated organization. And again, I knew I was tokenism, and I did feel a responsibility to speak up and not just be there and not challenge. And, um, but it was really a different world and men just absolutely did not understand what was happening to them and the change in their world. And they didn't understand why I was not, you know, a beautiful children, a beautiful family. They didn't understand those choices. And I didn't feel I needed to defend them, defend it, but it was very, 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 very different. I had, when I was in graduate school and I was pregnant, I had a professor say to me, well, why are you taking up a seat here? You're having a baby. And that was an wow. in, in academic, uh, you know, you know, and there were very few women in those days also that were going to college or graduate work and they were pregnant. That was not happening. It was very, very different. World. It's hard to understand the dramatic changes that are happening or that happened in the past, I don't know, 25, 35, 40 years. It's really extraordinary. Do you think in real time you you had a recognition or an awareness personally of the achievements, like the, the achievements about sort of your growth as a woman and what that meant for the generations to follow? Was that a part of your uh, constitution at the time or did it take years to reflect back on? I don't know that I was a feminist in those ways. I knew that women had the ability, the right to do it, but I was not marching for the cause. I was marching for things that I believed in and, of course, felt women could not or should not, not be excluded. In retrospect, and I did belong to women's groups and there were some women, women's organizations starting, but I don't think that was my primary objective. My primary objective was to do things that were meaningful. It would make a difference in where my passion was and certainly not exclude women or underserved or anybody that had skills. But I, I think now perhaps I'm, I, I feel more that way than I did maybe 30, 40 years ago. I just did it. Headroom is produced by Old Soul, a one-stop marketing agency that understands the power of brand and nuance. Reach out to my guy, Matt, at Old Soul and supercharge your brand and content strategy. That's Old Soul. 
shoot Matt a note at aoldsoul.com. That's A-O-L-D-S-O-U-L.com. And now back to our guest. Let's fast forward to a personal moment that you shared in a previous conversation and you, you touched on already in this discussion here today, but uh, take me back to the impact of your sister's passing at such an early age and how that obviously changed, not just you as a person, but it changed your, your path in life, given what you do and have been doing ever since. Well, it was an extraordinary loss. I mean, she was diagnosed at 32. She was two years younger than I. And um, to see her go through the brutal treatments, to go through the the treatments. And at one point we knew that she would not live. Uh, She had, she died at Duke, she had a bone marrow transplant and um, her daughter was four. She filmed, she knew she may not even, we expected her to live through the transplant, but knew that this was highly risky. And then getting that fatal call, we were watching her daughter in our house in DC from Duke that she was turning up, uh, getting a term for the worst. So we immediately got down there and then got to the hospital. She was already dead. And then we had to turn around and go home and tell her four-year-old that her mother was no longer alive. I mean, I just remember the moment. I remember her daughter was sitting on the steps in her house in Georgetown. And remember I had to, we had to, she, her, her father, tell her that her mother was dead, you know, and it was, uh, traumatic for me. And um, I couldn't get over it. It, 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 You know, my parents really were not uh, fully aware of how sick she was. I knew it, but didn't expect it. And nothing made sense because at that point, my life was perfect. Very, very successful real estate developer. We were making a lot of money. I had great husband, great marriage, great children, great career. So everything was perfect. Everything was, I was 42 and I had a perfect life. And then it just changed overnight and uh, none of it made sense. And then of course, oh, you'll learn to live with it or you'll get over it or life has to go on or the stupid things that people said to me. I remember going to work one day, I don't know, a month later and, and somebody said, how are you doing? I said, I don't have a cold. I don't have a cold. And I had a really hard time dealing with the loss. I just had a hard time making sense of it. I still do. It's 35 years later, and I still have a hard time day to day making sense of that. Um, but I knew I had to do something. I knew something had to change. You know, I talk, knew- talk about that moment, Ellen, when you when the light switch went on, um, because you're obviously you didn't have a cold, um, and I think that that is very eloquently uh, put. But there, I would imagine there was a moment, a, a morning you woke up and said, I want to do something. I want to do something with the, with the pain that I'm experiencing. I want to, I'm smart. I'm a comp, I know people like we can make some, we can make some inroads here to support other families that are going through what we went through. Well, yes. I mean, my family is a Duke family and uh, she was treated at Duke and I knew they did everything humanly possible. So went to Duke and said, we want to help. We have to change something. We have to prevent this with other people and started raising a lot of money for Duke, giving a lot of money, getting friends and family to give a lot of money, and then went on the board of the Cancer Center. And within a few years, three years, I became chair of the board of the Duke Cancer Center. And that was interesting because at that point, it was an old boys network, a bunch of, you know, Southern men. And like, here's this Jewish woman from New York who's a kind of radical leftist and and on Duke's, you know, (laughs) boy, what are you doing here? You know, but they kind of liked me because... um, I had a passion and I cared deeply and I wanted to learn a lot. And I spent several years, you know, at Duke. And then at one point there was a magical moment where I said, you know, Duke alone is not going to, no matter how much money I raise or give, they're not going to solve this problem alone. And then I had an opportunity to be on the National Cancer Advisory Board. I was a presidential appointee and that was another process. And I was appointed to the National Cancer Advisory Board. and. I remember the first time I had a meeting and everybody else was so extraordinarily accomplished and I was the token patient advocate, but they had in front of my name, Dr. Siegel. So everyone assumed I was a PhD or MD in biomedical and I wasn't. And I remember they gave us these huge books, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages to read. And I read everything 
and didn't understand anything. And I was in extraordinarily intimidated. I mean, I'll never forget the first meeting at this huge conference room at the National Cancer Institute saying, what am I doing here? I mean, how am I going to make a difference? And, you know, I stayed with it. I stayed with it. I listened. I read everything, didn't understand 90% of what I was reading. And at one point they decided they didn't know what to do with me. And they put me in charge of the budget. So I chaired the budget for the National Cancer Advisory Board. And at the time, the head of the national, we had a bypass budget and the head of the National Cancer Institute had what they called a bypass budget meant for Congress. And it was something like 700 pages. It was a ridiculous document. And um, I said to him, I went into his office and I marched into his office and I said, you know, I'm pretty smart. And I don't understand this budget at all. How are you going to have members of Congress understand this budget if I'm sitting here? They're, they're not any, they're less educated in cancer than I am. This budget makes no sense. You're not talking in human terms where people can relate to what you're trying to do. And he literally shoved the document in my face and said to me across the table and said, this is a scholarly document. I'll dare you. And I said, this is a scholarly document, not for scholars. And then uh, shortly after he changed, uh, uh, Klausner came to the NCI and he was inspirational. And I spoke to him and he got it. He understood if we were going to advocate for cancer, we had to advocate in terms of people related to or, or understood thousand page documents were not going to make the, the case for why we needed cancer funding. But I was not intimidated. At that point, I had enough confidence, but it took me a year or so to really understand where I could make a contribution and where my voice would be listened to without feeling hugely embarrassed. And I also knew who to listen to and who not to. How have these experiences impacted your role uh, in working or mentoring or advising um, women coming up through their career? Well, I tell them to go to be secure, to listen, not to let any artificial barriers stop them, and to really think about what they want to achieve. And I don't accept no as an answer, you know, I mean, but they have to do their homework. I mean, I worked hard at this, you know, I wasn't just passionate, I was really interested in execution and the ability to get something done and compromise, you know, at one point, I wanted everything when I started my work on FDA, you know, I insisted that everything had to change in cancer overnight. And guess what? Everything couldn't change overnight, but I was willing to work with them and convince others that we have to start to be pragmatic and moderate and they need to understand the goals and to over time, we will get what we need. So it's, it is a matter of being aspirational, but also being practical. And women have to do that too. We can't always have it all. We have to understand that sometimes compromise is important, but not compromise on values. You know, Ellen, it feels like we live in a very divisive time where isms continue to, um, it, it feels like, boil up to the surface in ways that we haven't seen for decades. We see it in our education systems. We see it sort of all throughout society. Where are we? If, if there's a scorecard on how we are as a society with regards to respecting females, empowering, providing the the infrastructure, that the, the elements needed so that we don't have to rely on the Ellens of the world to just be a trailblazer and to take, never take no uh, for an answer. Where are we in that and how much of it is substantive um, or just a facade or a veneer to what we really need to be doing and accomplishing? Well, I think there have been enormous gains for women. I think women have, it has changed substantially, but of course some of it is cultural. And, you know, I live in a very, in a world where women are, today accepted easily. And that isn't the barriers are not there. I do think women of color, minorities or underserved or people that don't have those advantages are still struggling. And we have to be very careful to advocate for them. I'm not suggesting for one moment that we should not stop advocating or mentoring women. We should, but we have to as difficult as it is for a highly educated white woman, imagine what it is like for minorities and underserved patients, people to basically have their voice and have those opportunities. So I feel very strongly about 
women, but also minority women and all underserved people. That is really where the battle is today. And I think we're very split. I think we have a lot of tokenism and we need to really mentor a new generation of these women and and minorities so they can serve and, and really have their voice. Let's take a, uh, a bit of a, a left turn here and talk and go into more detail about Friends um, and the establishment of that and where we are after, because um, you've just celebrated or you are celebrating an anniversary. Is that correct? 25 years. Um, so I served on the National Cancer Advisory Board and the head of the National Cancer Institute at the time was Rick Klausner, uh, is and was extraordinarily visionary. And he wanted to do something about the 25th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. And I said to him, and he was one of these people that had a full plate of visionary. I said, Rick, tell me what you want. What's most important? And he had 40 things, you know, tobacco, this. I said, no, tell me one thing. Tell me one thing that you really (laughs) care about that really matters. And he said, research, we have to really do something about research and continue research because we won't get the answers. And I had to form a nonprofit. Initially, I thought I could do it through my role at the National Cancer Advisory Board, but I couldn't do it that way. And I formed a nonprofit for one year. And I went to my partner and I said, I'm going to take a leave of absence. I'm not going to do any development for a year. And I'm going to advocate for cancer research funding. And the formula was going all over the country to members of Congress where there are cancer centers and really telling them that cancer matters in your community. People that are voting for you care about what you do about research funding. So we went where the money was. We went to members who were on appropriations on all the key committees and almost always matched up where there was a cancer center and patients that were being treated. And the goal was to show patients or show members that the money that they were putting into research went back to their community and benefiting their constituents. So after a year, I said, this is my calling. This is what I need to do. It was it was just extraordinarily important. And I went back to my partner and said, look, I cannot continue. And we made an arrangement that I would not do new development, but I would leave and keep the properties I had and we would co-manage them, but work it out. And uh, I did this for about eight years and it started to feel for me a little bit old or I was not able to measure exactly what we were doing. I knew we were making a difference, but you know, when you're going around the country asking for money for research, there are many people that advocate for that. It didn't, the formula felt a little old and I felt a little um, less uh, interested or I couldn't measure what we were doing other than it was making a difference, but I was no longer inspired. And when I'm not inspired, I don't do a good job. And I was going to close down Friends. And at that time, the same man, Rick Klausner, the head of the National Cancer Institute, asked me to look at clinical trials, the early stage clinical trials in a community setting and to see how that could be done and why that was not being done and to work with the pharmaceutical industry and the FDA to see what we could do about making sure trials were getting to the right people in a community. And that's when I started looking at the FDA and what was going on there. At that point, it was black box. I mean, we knew we didn't like it, but we didn't know why. And we knew it was intimidating, but didn't know how to fix it. And I spent a year with others, many others, you know, other professional societies, really researching uh, drug development at the FDA and how that was happening. And uh, Rick Pastor, the head of the cancer at uh, oncology at FDA, is the most inspirational person you could ever meet and was passionate about making a difference. And we looked at the structure and decided this is not going to work. We needed a dedicated cancer center, which was really a huge shift at the way things were happening at the FDA and went to the director of the the FDA at that time and to Janet Woodcock, uh, who is my inspiration, my friend, someone who I admire enormously and said, cancer is not working at FDA. You have to make a difference and do something. And she asked me to write a letter. We did as a community. 
and demanded we get a dedicated cancer center. And they came back to us and they said, well, we can't do that, but we can do this or that. We can integrate, we can elevate, we can make some substantial um, changes. And some of the community said, well, that's not enough. We need to go to Congress. And I had this strong feeling that we had to start the relationship. We had to start working with them, trying to understand and work with them and to take this half a loaf and to make it a full loaf. And that was the decision. And that was the pragmatism. I knew we were not going to get everything. It was impossible for them to deliver everything. But that didn't mean we couldn't start and still be aspirational. And and that continues to this day. I still don't think we have enough. And I still think we need to do more. And I think we need to empower cancer more. But I also understand other needs. And we have to take this in a way that we can get it done where it's not disruptive and yet help patients and science. So let's close with this, Ellen. So you know, people will talk about what chapter they feel like they are in their lives, right? And where what they've accomplished or haven't accomplished. But, you know, I get the sense from you that you we're not even sort of halfway through the book of, of Ellen here um, in regards to what you have left to accomplish and to pursue. What is the moral of your story um, when you think about not just empowering women, but just, just, I think, humans in general when it comes to perseverance, uh, it comes to a understanding and a relationship to fear that is not debilitating, uh, but empowering. Well, I think passion and never giving up is really important. We are going to have losses. We are going to have disappointments. We're going to be defeated. That is, and we're going to have enormous pain. But we wake up the next morning and go on and figure out how to sustain and not give up. It, it's hard. It's really hard. I mean, no path, no life is without enormous loss, pain, and, and disappointment, and, and failure. It is okay to fail. It is okay to fail, but learn about why and go on and don't give up. So it is passion. It is also grit. It's grit. It, it is really a matter of, and focus. You know, I, I think it was Thomas Edison, and I think I'm going to botch it, but basically he said a vision without execution is hallucination. So I do think that we do need to understand we will fail, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't help others and doesn't mean we ever give up. It means that we have to be real about it and continue with passion and helping individuals when it's not about the individual it has nothing to do with me it's about the individual patient and the individual people that can benefit that we have to care about because if it's all about us or me and all about I then we're not going to get this done it has to be about we and allowing other points of view and yes sometimes you know uh, making pragmatic decisions so you can move on you, you stole the words right from under me. I was going to say that my experience of you today has been much more on the we than it ever uh, has been on the I. And if I'm going to take anything uh, as being the, the one benefiting from this conversation, uh, it's that you have never approached, I mean, just in general, you haven't approached life from a perspective of what you could gain out of this. It was more pursuit to understand um, to grow and to incorporate in the we. And I think um, those that inter, inter, uh, act with you interface with all the work that you've done at the national level or for the better. And we want to thank you. I want to thank Ellen Siegel. Uh, what a pleasure. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger. Thanks for taking the plunge into Headroom, where we uncover the why behind the what and who impacting our lives. Headroom is a production of Rainlight and co-produced by our friends at Old Soul. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger, and this is Headroom.